Okay, so thank you very much for coming, everyone, especially on Sunday, last day, probably very few talks, by your last talk, so thank you for being here. So I'm uh, Riviera, I, I work at Red Hat, I'm a software engineer, and today I'm going to talk along with my colleague, Michael McCune, also working at Red Hat, about composable microservices for streaming analytics. And first, we're just going to give like a quick historical context or overview where this concept of microservices comes from. It's not necessarily where, where most people think of. Then we're going to briefly talk about the cat architecture, about streams, and then how we can view the streams as uh, these microservices as primitives, which we can use to build complex analytical systems. And then finally, uh, we're also going to show some examples of streaming uh, microservices in action. So, to briefly introduce historically the, the concept of, of microservices in the overloaded sense of the word, uh, we, we can trace it back probably to Ken Thompson, one of the creators of Unix and the Unix philosophy. So the Unix philosophy has many interpretations, but here we just have like a popular one from uh, Peter Sewers, and basically states that uh, we should thrive to build systems which do one thing, have components which should do one thing and do it well, uh, these programs should work well together, and sh they should also handle text streams because that is the universal interface. And as you'll see, these principles were originally applied to the Unix system, and they work for binaries working on the Unix system, but we can generalize them to modern uh, architectures, as we'll, we'll try to show you. So a simple example of this Unix philosophy is, for instance, pipelines, right? So, Pipelines allow us to chain the inputs and outputs of different processes. And in this case, that's exactly what you're doing. So we're reading an input file, we're passing it to another, uh, basically we're using a process called cat, which I'm sure everyone knows, to read an, uh, an input file. Then we're sending the output of that process to, to a text processing uh, program. And then we're sorting it using another program. And then finally, you're writing it to, to, to disk. So one advantage of, of this, uh, way of laying out things is this is very composable. So if at any point we want to do some further processing, like we want to, say, remove any kind of duplicate lines, we can just insert a command in the middle of this pipeline that does exactly that. So a modern architecture that follows very loosely this kind of, of, of philosophy, of the Unix philosophy, is a microservice architecture. So what is a microservice in, in today's context? So ideally, a microservice has many things in common with, with Unix philosophy. So we tend to write programs or processes that one th do one thing and do it well. We try to write programs or services that work very well together. But this time, we're just not using a, a text stream. So we're being more general. We're using well-defined APIs over the network because that is a universal interface. So let's just look at some of the commonalities between microservices and Unix philosophy and some of the differences. What are the technical differences? Well, for instance, uh, previously, we, sorry, yeah, skip one, All right. So one of the differences is before we were handling, uh, we were dealing with uh, programs or processes, binaries on the disk, right? And those were like the, our computational units. And now we're dealing in microservice world with uh, some kind of a server, so something that's living, uh, it's running by itself, and it's communicating via some kind of uh, protocol like, like HTTP or RPC, et cetera. Sorry. <laughs> so another difference is uh, configuration, right? So a way to configure uh, Command lines is obviously the CLI, the common line interface. So that's the way we pass arguments, we pass the data, or we pass configuration to the processes. And in uh, microservice world, the way we do that is usually we configure a process at deployment time using JSON or YAML or some kind of configuration file, and also the API. So the API is well defined, and that allows us to configure the, the, the running microservice at runtime. So let's say if you have a REST uh, service, then we can actually specify which kind of for data format we want back, or we can send extra data, extra parameters, et cetera. And finally, uh, we have the communication. So that's quite different. Obviously, in the Unix world, we communicate via the pipes or, or, or redirection. And in the, Unix, in the microservice world, we're actually using the network uh, for communication between the microservices. So, sorry. <laughs> 
it's quicker, it's not on its best day. So why should we use microservices? So we're just gonna briefly, because uh, how many of you are familiar with microservices and microservice architecture? Okay, so some of you are familiar. So for the ones which are not familiar, I'm just gonna do a very quick overview of what are the advantages of using this kind of, of architecture. So we're gonna start with uh, the simplest one, which is the code simplification. So microservices allow us to reduce, compared to a monolithic application, the code surface area. So that means that our code is gonna be specialized on a single task. Hopefully it's gonna be simpler uh, because we can focus on, on a specific task. We don't have to worry about how it fits with the global overview of, of, this, of the entire application. We have a well-defined API and that's how we communicate with the world. Also, it reduces the cognitive load of the developer because instead of opening like a code base with millions of lines, you can actually focus on a very well-contained piece of code and you can look at it. So, it also introduces a separation of, of, of concerns. So, I mean, actually using separation, having the separation of concerns, we can do things which are very useful to us as a developer, like decoupling unit testing. So if anyone had to do a continuous integration on a monolithic app, it was, it's particularly difficult, right? It's very easy to overlook some subtleties on, on the testing scenarios, or you know, there's always something you might wanna miss or you never uh, planned for. And if you have, obviously, have a smaller component of code with well-defined API, then it's much easier to, to create testing scenarios or continuous integration for that. It also allows for uh, parallel development, which means, I mean, if you have like a big team of, of developers, they can actually work on the services uh, almost in isolation. So if you have a well-defined API, defined a priori, uh, you don't have to wait for another component of your system to be ready. So you can actually mock data, you can, you can simulate calls to the API, so you can progress your work on a specific service without being blocked by someone which hasn't finished a bit of a, of a massive monolithic application. So this also um, allows things like uh, simplifying refa uh, refactoring, for instance. Let's say you have uh, a bunch of services on, on your application, right? And you want to change the internals of one of, one of them. Say so you find a better algorithm for it or you find a better framework that, than the one you were using. So that's quite easy to do in isolation, right? If you, the API is stable and it's well-defined, then obviously you can just change whatever is inside the microservice. And if it works, if it you know, passes all the tests, then you should work finding the rest of the system. Uh, another thing which, which allows for this kind of easy, simplified refactoring and the fact that you can have a polyglot development, right? Because one of the problems of monolithic apps is that you're always gonna try to find something that's a silver bullet, right? You, you try to find a runtime for the entire system, a framework that does everything, that's very difficult. In this architecture, you can actually pick the best tool for the job. So say you wanna write a REST server in Python or you wanna write something else on, on Java or using Node.js, that, that's fine, you can do that. And in fact, if you wanna refactor the code, so you wanna rewrite Python bit on Go, or hopefully the other way, I don't know, Perhaps you easily. So these are big advantages of using microservices in, in development. But it's not the silver bullet as well. So as with any architecture, uh, there, are some, there are some problems. So for instance, you might have orchestration problems. So say you have like a multitude of, of microservices. You're not just sure you're talking about you're at 2,000 microservices which have to communicate between themselves. So that can be a real problem to orchestrate them. So right, services might go down, you need to read the take care of the plumbing, that might, might be a problem. Versioning might be also a problem because we talked about parallel development, right? What happens when someone is doing a microservice and it changes the breaking changes, right? You have to know that your services are communicating with the right version of the API. Security is also a concern almost in any field of you know, development. So you have to make sure that you have authentication set up, that services can call what you were made for originally, that services have the right responsibilities, and of course, things like uh, communication should be encrypted. And finally, you have discovery, service discovery. So in a fully automated uh, application, you might want services by themselves don't know that other services exist. So you have to have some kind of registry or catalog to find the microservices. 
So fortunately, there are tools which in conjunction with good practices allow you to uh, overcome some of these challenges. So, you know, platforms such as OpenShift or Kubernetes, they allow you to solve some of these problems like the orchestration versioning uh, and uh, some, uh, up to a certain point security and also discovery by, you know, giving you tools to, to deal with this. And this coupled with good practices should minimize most of the problems we talked about. So another misconception is the fact that uh, microservices solve scalability problems, right? So that's not true by itself. Like changing your monolithic app to a microservice is not going to magically solve your scalability problems. But microservices being usually stateless by nature, uh, they, make, they are a natural fit for containerization. And in platforms such as OpenShift or Kubernetes, that means you have an easy way to scale out your system, right? So if you have stateless microservices, you can just increase the number of instances of microservices and you don't have to worry about it. Even if your microservices are not stateless, if they have to keep state of some kind, or the problem is not the actual microservice. So I say you have a microservice that performs heavy computational loads. You can still use a microservice architecture by, for instance, connecting it to a Spark cluster. Uh, so how many of you are familiar with Spark, with Apache Spark? Okay, so Spark is a distributed computing framework. So basically what it do, does is distributes the, the, the cal calculations or computations or whatever you want to do by several nodes on a cluster and it, it does the processing in memory and you can scale it easily by adding more nodes to that cluster. So basically if you have a way of making your microservice communicate with a cluster, if you're having a computational bottleneck, then you can just you know, give more nodes to the Spark cluster and it's still using a microservice architecture. So a common uh, nomenclature, a way of referring to uh, the stream processing architecture is usually the Kappa architecture. So the Kappa architecture, very broadly, uh, works by not disposing of the, the batch processing layer on an application. And what you want to do now is deal with streams, which are basically coming from a, a append-only immutable log. I guess the, the first example that comes to your mind is, is Kafka, so you can use something like Apache Kafka, which turns events into streams. And basically now, our microservices are going to react to the streams in real time. So we don't have any kind of batch layer, or we can do micro batches, but you know, we're, not, we're not like storing a huge amount of data, processing it overnight, so the results on the next day. So we're doing things with data in motion. And with the Kappa architecture, we, 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 we notice a pattern, which is since our stream layer, so the, the Apache Kafka in this case is immutable, what we're doing is we're consuming streams, we're processing them, and we're writing new streams. So we're not actually changing the original stream in any way. So any of the outputs of these stream processors will be new streams, which could be in turn read by other services. So stream architecture also has some challenges, obviously, uh, and the most of all would be, I mean, these are just a pick of four common problems with working with stream-based architectures. Latency will be one, obviously. If one of your microservices introduces a heavy latency on the processing, obviously all the other services consuming it are gonna suffer from it. Uh, Stateful transformations are not very, very trivial to do, especially if you want to do something complex. So obviously, if you just want to transform a stream without keeping state, that's going to be easier, but sometimes you need to do stateful transformations. As always, security is a problem. If you have data in motion, should be encrypted, authorizations, as we mentioned, etc. And stream reconciliation, obviously, is a big problem because you're always going to have failures at some point, and uh, you're going to have to, to deal with them. So now I just want to introduce, uh, oh, sorry. I just want to introduce uh, what we wanted to talk basically, which is how to use microservices then to build modular analytics architectures. So an interesting thing is that um, usually when you, when you go to a microservice talk, you, you, you listen about how you can split business uh, concerns, so you, you can put business logic, like you have the ordering microservice, you have the billing microservice, etc. 
But here we propose to think of them at even more uh, finely uh, granular level, so, so really small primitives of computation. So if you look at the microservice as a really small unit of computation, it has one really simple task. You can start finding, for instance, uh, some uh, similarities between this type of stream programming and functional programming. So as we talked uh, before, streams are immutable, right? So here what you're doing is just applying some kind of mapping of a function to an immutable quantity. You know, that's like a fundamental principle of, of functional programming. Uh, these, uh, these microservices can be composed, right? So this is like a typical function programming comp composition. So you can add microservices which read from one stream right to another stream, and those are the inputs of other streams, right? Cascade of transformations, and you're creating new streams. So this is another pattern that you find in And for instance, you can, you can even think of, of referential transparency as in functional programming. That means that you can take one of these services and actually replace it by two services that overall do the same thing and compose those two, right? You can replace lambda two by two further services, and then we will have the same uh, functionality without changing anything else on the application. And, I mean, you have lots of constructs with microservices that, you know, give you, like, building blocks and primitives, like, in, in programming. So you can have microservices that you uh, stream splitting, right, that will be, like, a conditional branching. So they're writing to one stream if you set aside one to another one. You have filtering, you can have microservices that you're filtering. You can have uh, reduce operations, right? You can have a, a microservice that consumes from several streams. It's combining them. Again, this is like a stateful transformation. It's keeping some kind of state, some accumulator, but it's transforming them into a new stream. So I'll just quickly show like a simple example, like a, the, one of the most simple examples you can think of making this work. So this is not going to be a complex application, but here you're using primitives to build an analytic system. So let's assume you have uh, some kind of uh, numerical data coming into a stream. It doesn't matter what it is. It's a bunch of numbers coming in. And you want to create a service that's going to calculate a mean and a variance of that data that's coming in in an online way, right? Okay, so this is like a stateful transformation, but it's, it, you're just keeping like an accumulator. Basically, you're transforming. It's like a reduce operation. And then you're going to write that, that uh, mean and variance uh, values to another stream, which is going to be read by a QSUM or a, a cumulative control chart, which is basically a way of detecting abrupt changes on, or a drift on a series of values. But now, we're not trying to detect a drift on the original data. We're trying to detect the drift of the mean. So you're basically just detecting we have a stable mean, let's say number of visitors on, on our website or whatever. We want to know if that changes abruptly. It, it might be growing, it might be going down, but you know, if it's not abruptly, it's fine. And then we write those values again to, an, to a further stream. So, I mean, here you can see then some of the advantages. Like, like I mentioned, for instance, the refactoring. Let's say that now you're not interested in calculating the mean so you're interested in calculating just the variance, right? So you can just rewrite that microservice to do something else, and everything else in the system will be work as previously. You're still detecting a drift or an abrupt change on whatever's coming from that stream. It's just, it's just a different thing now, you know? So you don't have to rewrite anything else on your system. Or if you want, let's say you have like a predictive model, and you want to try to predict how that variance is going to look like, say, in two days or, or, or any other interval. Then you just consume from that variance stream, you perform the prediction with a trained model on a microservice, and then you get an output, which is written to another stream. And actually, you can actually see, you can pipe it back to, to the cumulative sum and see, well, does the prediction value actually changes abruptly? So you can see how you can compose and create complex uh, analytic systems just with simple primitives. Um, so, as I mentioned, some of these services are, are stateful. Uh, one of them is not. Uh, the prediction one is not, but in the sense that it's not, you know, it's impotent in a way. 
but the various sort of QSIM uh, services, they're, they're actually stateful. So you know, you can actually see them as accumulators working on a new sequence of numbers. So now I'm going to pass to my colleague Mike, and he's going to give uh, uh, an example. He's going to show some examples of microservices in action. Thanks, Rui. All right, so Rui did a great job of kind of showing us the theoretical side of this. And what I'd like to do now is take some of that theory and show how we're doing it on OpenShift. Uh, how many people here are familiar with Kubernetes or OpenShift? A couple of people, okay. So Kubernetes, and by extension OpenShift, because OpenShift is a, an enterprise packaging of Kubernetes, an open source enterprise packaging. But Kubernetes is a system for orchestrating containers across a, a cluster of physical nodes. And so what we're gonna do with this, and I'll just uh, Things really slow. Okay, so we'll look at, <coughs> this is kind of the generalized architecture that we're gonna play with today, right? We, we're gonna have two topics on our stream. We'll be using Kafka to do this. Who here is familiar with Apache Kafka? Okay, a bunch of people. So this, we have a broker that's handling this message stream. We have two different named topics. Now we're gonna have a data generating service at the top that's gonna push data into our first topic. And then what we'll do is we'll show an example of an application that just reads from that just to take the data and doesn't necessarily do anything with it. And then we'll look at another application that takes the data and does something with it and plays it out onto the second topic. And then we'll, we'll look at another application that reads from that so we can kind of verify what's going on. There's like a delay between one I Yeah, so Okay, so, but first I'm gonna talk about the, kind of the technology that you'll see here. So we're using OpenShift as our platform because that's kind of the developer platform that we like to use. Uh, we're using Kafka as our message broker and Apache Spark as our uh, compute cluster. And Spark gives us a very easy way to generalize operations across uh, a distributed cluster of machines. And we're using that in a containerized way so that we can really leverage the power of Kubernetes to give us a scale out potential kind of across an abstracted hardware layer. And then lastly, um, I'm using Python for all the samples I wrote here just because I, I really like Python and it, I think it's kind of easy. Um, so how many people here are familiar with Python? Okay, now how many people are comfortable enough to look at a little code from Python? Okay. So this will be the first uh, example that we'll dive into when it, I'm gonna turn the crank here or something. And, and I know if I hit it again, it'll go too far. So this is the first application we're gonna look at. Our data stream is gonna be a series of random numbers, okay? So this is kind of like the mean example that Rui was talking about before. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna filtering application that's going to either filter out all the even numbers or filter out all the odd numbers. And it will play those onto a second topic. All right, so I'll show you real quick the filter <coughs> function that I'm gonna use. And I'm using there's a wrapper application that I actually have that's doing the Spark interaction, but at the core of that wrapper application, this is the function that I'm gonna to apply to everything that comes across the stream. And because uh, things that, you know, what, the data that we're dealing with coming off of Kafka is in a string format, and we're gonna play back on a string format. So this function expects some sort of string value, and then it will return either a string value or a none, depending on if we wanna play the value onto the second topic. So what we're, what we're looking at here is the console of OpenShift. And each one of these uh, pods, as they're called here, is a view into a container. Now this one called the generator is our random number generator. And it, you can see it's got a blue ring there. That means that container is running right now. And if I click into it, you can see a little information here and I wanna show this to touch on some of the topics that Ruri was talking about. You can see 
Up here it says what the image is, and there's a, like a hash at the end of it, and it tells us what build it was, and you know where it, the source is actually the. This was built directly from a Git repo and then deployed into OpenShift, so I never built the image. OpenShift built it for me, and you, that source line is actually the last commit message that came out of there. So you can see how I'm already having a view into what version of the software I'm running. So it's very easy for me to monitor that. And then this at the bottom is telling me a little bit about what's exposed into this application, um, you know, networking wise and whatnot. Now, right now, if I look at the logs for this, I won't really see anything because it's not printing out. It's maybe has some error logs or whatever, but that's all it's printing out. So I'm gonna start the first application here that I'm calling the listener. Now, I didn't know how much time we would have for this, so I built this application ahead of time and on OpenShift and I've scaled it down so it's not running. What I'm gonna do is scale it up. And as it starts to run, right now it's pulling the image and it's starting it. I'm gonna go into this pod. And I'm gonna look at the logs that are coming out. And I'm, I'm actually looking at the wrong topic right now. So what I need to do is redeploy this. So I, I was playing with this to try and get it working the way I wanted to. And the way that we're injecting information into this application is I'm using environment variables inside the container. And so Kubernetes allows me to modify what's going on inside that container. And I'm using those environment variables to tell it where to read from. So the first thing I'm gonna do is tell it to read from a topic in Kafka called numbers, which is my random number topic. This is one of the really nice things you know, that I like about OpenShift and Kubernetes. You can see that it's automatically redeploying the application for me, and it's handling the cutover of the networking to make sure that it doesn't start until, until the other one is over. Okay, so we can see is that too small? Can everyone see that? You can see it's spitting out numbers here. And this is, all, this is the log part. This is just the raw message we're getting from the stream. And so what I'll do now is I'll start up our filtration service. And I'm calling it the evens filter because it's going to filter out all the even information, all the even uh, numbers. Now, Ruri and I work on a project, a community project called Rad Analytics, which is focused on creating or, or helping empower people to write these kind of machine learning applications in containerized environments. And what we're gonna see is, as this application starts up, it is, oh, it's still pulling the image it looks like. Or perhaps I broke, okay. So it, it's pulling the image because when I built this, I'm running on a seven node cluster. So there are seven VM or seven you know, virtual machines that I have running in Google's cloud right now. And that's the, the cluster that's running this. We, we used this for a lab earlier. So I built this image and the image was built on one of those nodes, but Kubernetes scheduling has decided to run it on a different node this time. So the image had to be pulled to that other node. So it's probably running now. And as we see it start up, some of the tooling that we created is going to automatically deploy an Apache Spark cluster for us and bind it to the application. So right now it's spawning the Spark cluster and those, those images are being deployed. And if we look at the, the logs for this, what we'll see is that right now the app, this is the tooling that we've injected into the container. So this is actually happening before your application runs and it's waiting for the Spark master it's found the Spark Master, and now it's waiting for the workers to come alive. And so the workers are starting to come alive now. And once the workers are alive, it will start running, and now it's starting to process the stream and apply that function to the stream. So let's go back. And if anybody has questions about what I'm doing, please stop me, and you know, it's perfectly fine. We can discuss any of these topics. So I'm gonna go back to the listener now and I'm gonna put it back on that evens topic so I can see if I'm actually getting the evens information. And we can see again, it's, it's redeploying for us. It's pretty quick because this, this app you know, starts up very fast. This kind of goes back to what we were talking about with the do one thing, do it well. It's, it's very small so it can start up very quickly. 
So I hit the logs. And now what you can see is, okay, we're, first of all, we've changed the message. So now I've structured the message that I'm playing onto the second topic. Maybe this is, what our, this is how we've defined our API. And you can see it's just pulling out all the even numbers and filtering them. So this, this is pretty simple, right? This is a very basic example. But I hope you can see how you might be able to use this to do something a little more complex. And that, that's what we're going to get into now. So let's look at something more complicated, transforming data and actually analytics to what we're doing. So in this example, what we're going to be getting is these complex messages that kind of look like a update, right? Like maybe this is a Twitter update or something. You know, we have an update ID and a user ID and the text that came, you know, I don't care to take another bite, hashtag Thursday, hashtag Halloween. So someone ate too much candy or something and they want to tell the world about it. And what we want to do, because perhaps we're the social media provider, we want to do sentiment analysis on each one of these to see if someone's saying something positive or negative, or maybe we want to learn if people are using uh, phrases that break our terms of service, or we want to find out if there's harassment going on. And so we're going to use analytics to create this sentiment that will tell us what it thinks about that statement. And to do that, we're going to use Spark again, but this time we're going to use uh, two Python packages uh, called Spacey and Vader. And one of them is a, a language uh, kind of deconstruction tool that tokenizes the language into the parts of a you know, sentence. And the other one is an analysis tool that tries to make up and you know, tries to determine the sentiment of what's going on. And what we're going to see is that you know, my workflow is very similar to what I was doing. I have the generator running in a different project. Uh, I have another listener, and these are, you know, some of these applications are things that I use over and over again. So you imagine the CAT tool or the LS tool in your operating system. These are tools that we've built. This listener is a tool that we like to use with Kafka because it's very easy to deploy this microservice. And then I don't have to worry about like SSHing into a machine inside the cluster to get a command line to read the Kafka topic because that's all hidden behind the networking that's going on in OpenShift. I haven't exposed any of this to the outside world. I'm only going through this uh, console to see what's happening. Now if I, hopefully I didn't misconfigure this one. I did. So <laughs> I'm gonna have to deploy it again. And what, you know, what happened here is that I didn't, I didn't reset this to look at the source. So let's look at the source to begin with. And you can see like, you know, one of the things I like about this is this, this app is just very quick to redeploy. So it's, it's not as quick as using the command line, but you could imagine, you know, some people talk about the cloud as the new operating system, right? So if that's the case, then these microservices are starting to become the utilities that we'll use, you know, to pipe together data. So look at the logs and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause this because it's going back pretty quick. But you can see we're, we're getting that, we're getting these, messages like we saw in the slide, right? You know, there's the update, the user, and, and some information to go with it. So now, what I want to do is start up this uh, sentiment generation application. And I'm just calling it the transformer here. And it's prop, unless it get randomly hits the same node again, it didn't, oh, it did. So you see this one started very quickly and it's already spawning the Spark cluster for us. You know, one of the nodes is already up. So while that's happening, I'll, I'll relaunch my listener again to look at the, the new topic. And as soon as it, it may already be generated. Okay, so it's, it's not receiving any information yet, but What's happening right now is like we saw with the other application, it's waiting for Spark to spin up, you know, and the, the other application isn't doing anything yet, but here we go. Okay, some information's coming across. I'll just stop this quickly. You can see now the messages, there's our message, but we've added the sentiments, right? So the application that we wrote is used the sentiment analysis on our Spark cluster to apply this. 
And the reason that we're using Spark to do this is because Spark is designed for distributed processing. And so we can do a lot of generalized processing and it gives us a very easy way to horizontally scale that. So I, in this case, I'll do it manually, but there are tools that will automate this for you. And let's say that, let's say that I was Twitter, right? And I'm getting thousands, hundreds of thousands of messages a second coming in. This, this stream is operating at 10 messages a second. It's not very fast. But if that were the case, it would be very easy for me to just scale up. So we say, I'm gonna scale up my Spark cluster to have four pods now running, right? So the, this, this dash W, are the workers, you know, Spark has a master worker kind of relationship. So the master node is controlling the workers and it's distributing information out to the work to be done. So now if the stream gets faster, we can scale this up and if it slows down, we can scale it down. And um, there's a project that we have on the, on the Red Analytics site that's actually doing this automatically. It looks at logs coming out of Spark and it sees when Spark says, I've got too much pressure, I need more executors to execute this. And it will tell Kubernetes or it will tell OpenShift to up the number of executors until it sees that pressure go down. And then if the pressure goes off, it can reduce that number. So you can start to get automated scaling inside of your application pipelines, as it were. And this, you're not really gonna see any you know, output from that because the, the, the stream is just not going fast enough to really do anything. But, you know, what you, what you could do, and this is, we've exposed this, um, you know, if we needed to examine what was happening, this is now looking into our Spark Master and we can see, you know, kind of what's going on. It's using up, like, it's trying to grab an outrageous amount of memory and it's, you know, four cores running on each one of those. So you can start to introspect into what's happening with your Spark cluster. Okay, so at this point, what I might do, now that I've created this second transformation stream, is perhaps I'll build applications to go on that other stream. Maybe I'll pass it off to another group so they can do it. And at this point, what happens is the messaging, that we, the schema that we're using in that topic becomes an API. And so if I publish that schema within my organization and I publish the brokers that this information is coming on, we could allow developers to uh, get access to this and experiment with the data to you know, take it to different groups and, and show off different ways of interacting with the data. And it helps to go into something that Ruri was talking about, which is parallel development. You know? So once I've set this architecture up, maybe my group is interested in doing the sentiment analysis, but perhaps there's another group that's interested in doing a more complex analysis on the underlying data that's there they could use the same data stream and start creating their own applications. And we can do this completely you know, alongside each other without needing to communicate about the APIs between our applications. The schema that's on the topic is what becomes important at that point. Go back here. All right, so let's talk about some practical concerns that come up when you're operating in this type of environment, right? Like I just said, message formats are gonna be something that they become the API. So in the past, we might use something like, uh, if we're creating a Rust server, you might use Open API. Are, are you familiar with Swagger or Open APIs? Okay, so this is a, a format for describing an API for a Rust endpoint. You might use gRPC, which has very structured uh, uh, templates that can tell you what the structure of the API is. But these are programmatic APIs. Again, the messaging formats now become uh, kind of a de facto API or a soft API. You know, this is the schema you can always expect. It'll just be one number, and these numbers are coming from you know, sensor data, perhaps, on a specific device that's in the field. And so you say, well, we've got uh, buses all around town, and we want to monitor uh, you know, the, some sort of G-force sensor inside of it to see if there's been an accident or something, right? So you could imagine a stream for each bus that exists in your city and applications on each one of those streams doing the mean calculation, looking for big deviations, you know. As long as the message format is, is the same and you publish that internally, many different groups could be like creating value out of that data. Another thing is brokers and topics and kind of configurations. 
So this kind of goes hand in hand with the message format schemas, is that you, these will be something you'll need to publish internally, or maybe you don't want to publish it internally. Um, Kafka has a very deep uh, security mechanism on it that allows gating for who can have access to which streams. And, and these are ways that you'll have to kind of share the information internally so that all your developers can either get access to it or not have access to it. Also, data provenance. And this was something that Ruri touched on a little bit, which is if I have a message come into my system, and we saw with the synthetic uh, social media data, I had like a user ID and a message ID, right? If I just took the text and added sentiment to it and then got lost the user ID and the update ID, those next applications wouldn't, on the next stream, wouldn't know where it came from. They wouldn't know maybe how to look back and say, what, what user is this? What is this user's history? Uh, you know, do they have a history of making really negative comments or really positive comments? You know, those are things that your applications would want to do to bring the data together. So you, you'll have to be very careful about how much information do you persist into the other streams. And then getting into testing can be a really interesting situation as well because you want to have good data streams to test from and it's not always easy to use the data that's coming live. But Kafka makes it really nice in that you can replay old streams. So you could test against streams that have already come in to say like, what if we want to change a, a machine learning model that's doing some sort of predictive analysis? We could take some data that we just saw the day before, run the new model against it and see if anything's changed. And you saw how easy it was for me to manipulate OpenShift and kind of deploy different applications. I could create those testing applications in separate projects and have them run against live data, and then I can do kind of like A-B testing or, or blue-green deployments where I can you know, determine which one of these do we think is working better for what we're doing. And I think you know, debugging is always tough. It's even more so tough in that when you're in the cloud, you could see how my access to those containerized applications, it wasn't like I wasn't get shelling in. I was looking at logs. I was examining their, their health based on Kubernetes. So, You'll have to think about that as you're making your applications. You know, we always want to be putting good logging in our apps. We always want to be putting out good you know, exception traces and whatnot. That becomes really important when those logs are your main view into what's happening with the application. So I want to just review what we talked about today. We talked about kind of the Unix philosophy and how we think that's important to microservices, you know, kind of chaining from one to the next and using an easy format between them. <coughs> we talked about microservices and how, you know, they, we think they should be contained in a way where, where you've got the structure with some sort of API, a clean interface, and the application sitting behind it. And we also talked about the Kappa architecture and how you can really leverage streams and the applications that sit between them to, to really unlock your data and transform it in interesting ways. And so this uh, QR code will take you to a GitHub repository where you can find code samples for everything you saw today that, that I ran here. And there's instructions. So you can, you can deploy this yourself and experiment. And radanalytics.io is the community project that we work on. You can find lots of tooling for OpenShift and, and Spark and a lot of tools that we're you know, really trying to empower people to take these things and have fun and you know, play with the data and make your own things. And if you'd like to get in touch with myself or with Huri, here's our email addresses and our Mastodon IDs if you're on that network. So I guess with that, um, any questions? Okay, very good. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I saw that you, you, put, uh, you put it the Kafka cluster on the fly. Is this uh, the normal way? I think the Kafka cluster generally is considered almost always available, but for your samples, did you just say I want Kafka? The Kafka cluster was already, is already running, actually. Um, okay. So Kafka, well, I want, there, I had another project on there called Kafka. And in there, I, the brokers are running in there. So they've actually been running you know, all day pretty much. I didn't just start it up now. But there's a project called Strimzy uh, at strimzy.io. They've done some great work. You know, we can talk to Jacob if you want some more information. The, it makes it really easy to deploy Kafka into OpenShift. 
and, and into uh, Kubernetes. And you just take, you deploy these scripts and within a, a minute or two, you'll have a Kafka broker up and running. So it is very, I could have deployed it here. I just didn't want to push the time. But good, good question, thank you. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'm not sure about that. Oh, yeah, sorry. So you were saying in Kafka, do we have support for the Confluence? Confluence Shema Registry. The Confluence Shema Registry? I, I don't know. I'd, I'd have to look into that. Maybe, maybe we can talk you know, afterwards or something. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much.